next time. <laughs> uh, what we'd like to talk today uh, about is some of our work uh, with teachers to try to uh, remake uh, science education. Uh, too often in schools, science education is a collection of topics, and it's difficult sometimes to discern why those topics and what they have to do with one another. We're interested in creating a science education that people say in a mathematics education would take for granted, something that is cumulative and hopefully coherent. So um, we'd like to start by thinking about how we might think about science to guide this kind of effort to remake it. Uh, well, one, uh, one branch says that science is basically a logic game. And so the emphasis in programs that follow this kind of metaphor is putting uh, students in the position of conducting experiments and thinking about design. So the emphasis is on control of variables often, and that's a kind of general method that goes across these uh, different activities that students engage in. Another approach is to think about philosophy of science and say, well, what scientists do is they build theories. So what we should be concerned about is uh, theory development, and we might emphasize things like whether or not the th uh, theory is fruitful or plausible, if it's coherent, is the knowledge connected? And that would be another approach. Uh, a third approach is to think very hard about what do scientists do? What kinds of practices do they engage in? And maybe that can be the guiding light of a science education. So we're in choice three. And <clears throat> what we think is that we look across sciences. You'll see a lot of disunity. But across different sciences, the thing that most scientists are engaged in is construction and revision of models. And by a model, we th think of an analog system. So first you have to have a system that you're familiar with, and then you need to think about its mappings to nature and back. So we think about analogical systems as the root of what we do. However, um, we're talking about working with children. So it's not enough to look at what scientists do and say, oh, that's a good model. Instead, we have to think about modeling in light of children's development. So <clears throat> we have this little taxonomy that we think of in modeling. The first is the idea that we can use resemblance to make the mappings from the base to the target systems a little easier. Here's an example from a first, second grade class they were studying rotting tomatoes in the schoolyard. Uh, at the time, we were at Wisconsin. So mid-October rolled around, and it got really cold. This is before the such noticeable change to climate. I, it might even be above freezing now in October in Wisconsin. So <clears throat> we had to think about how we would bring the process into the classroom. So students built um, compost columns. And the question is, in what ways is the compost column like what was going on out in the schoolyard? So some of the questions included ideas like, well, we see bits of paper, we see styrofoam. Are these things that we should put in our compost column? So even though it's a very simple system, we still are questioning about, well, how closely does it have to resemble? Along the way, students encountered issues like mold, is it alive? And unfortunately, um, there were some unwelcome guests as we ported things from outside inside. And before long, the school was infested with fruit flies. <laughs> but we took this as an opportunity to learn. <laughs> <laughs> and here's one of the forms of learning. The students went around and canvassed the, the school looking for these fruit flies. And they tried to conduct counts in different classrooms and try to create a representation of the relative counts of these fruit flies. Now, in the classroom, the offenders are here. And you can see a pretty good explanation, because <clears throat> green 
uh, is a high count, you can see why the classrooms adjoining might have fruit flies. But it's another opportunity to think uh, through this representation. We're stretching from the microcosm to the representation because what would account for this and for this? So things are pretty distant, and unfortunately this got to be a little touchy because it has to do with resources for fruit flies in different classrooms. <laughs> okay, another kind of um, system we could think about is one where resemblance is not as obvious. And we like to think about that what we're uh, porting over is the syntax of the system. So for example, if students are studying food preferences, one possibility is to ask, well, in what way is this a real choice versus what would happen merely by chance? So there, we're not preserving resemblance between chance devices and birds, but we are trying to preserve the structure. And finally, we have this idea that there will be some classes of things for which it would be helpful to develop models where things interact and the qualities of the model are determined by those interactions. Those are the familiar form of modeling to us, something like a kinetic model of gases, but we're interested in other representational approaches that are emerging because of computational power, maybe using something like star logo and agents and thinking about programming the interactions among the agents as a way into these forms of models. So if we're going to do this, it turns out that we need a source for the systems that we're seeking to map. And what this means to us is that we have to rethink elementary mathematics. We can't be content with only arithmetic. We need capacities to visualize, to measure, to think about data, and to make inferences in light of variability. Because otherwise, we have the dreaded lab experience where you know what you're supposed to get before you start, and the game is to see if you can get it. <clears throat> Along with that, then we see elementary science as the invention and revision of models. And that's something that we'd like to promote from earliest grades on. So I'm going to first start with a little tour of the kinds of mathematics that we would ask young children to engage in to make this approach possible. Um, this is an investigation conducted by second graders who are investigating qualities of symmetry by designing quilts. And this is one of their investigations, taking a unit, applying tr different kinds of transformations, and looking at the changes in the resulting design. The questions can get fairly complicated. They can start to think about the relationship of the unit to the types of designs that might be possible. So they can ask some pretty deep questions, even though they're pretty young. We also engage children in investigating 3D structure. These are some kindergartners from Phoenix trying to think about what is alike and different in the structures that they build. But <clears throat> this is from a third grade classroom. We can also get to some pretty interesting and deep mathematics. That's a representation of a cone that's been sliced, just horizontally sliced. And <clears throat> this representation the idea is that when you fold it back up, it should make that truncated cone. This doesn't work. This doesn't work either, but it's interesting to think about why not. So what they have to do is coordinate the circumference length with the length of the sides. This will work. So these are forms of investigation about 3D structure that later come in handy when you want to think about things like volume. Well, 
my computer shows <laughs> two different things. <laughs> one has an image, one doesn't. Okay, what you should see is that this is a game of tag in the first grade, and uh, the game is called Mother May I, and what we have is a target, someone is it, and a bunch of uh, movers, people who could get tagged, or in this game it's the other way around, you try to get to the mother, and the question arises, what's fair? And so the kids are literally in different configurations trying to think about what would be a fair way to play this game. And it turns out that distance is the key to fair play. So the notion is, can we represent this situation with this form? So here we have a line and a point, and this is not fair. Okay, these are the movers, this is the target. That's what it should have. Okay. <laughs> okay, so children went and explored other kinds of shape and form. And this was a very promising one. They said this square has all sides the same, so this will definitely do it. But there are some problems at the corners. And so, much to their surprise, they had differences in lengths in, um, in the square, and the diagonal of the square versus the sides. Eventually, we found this form. And along the way, we were investigating properties of this form. How would we find its center? How would we measure length? And could this be a general description of this situation? Here's some work, again, with young children, first graders. How do you wake up? Everyone writes how they wake up. They put it on the board. And the question is, all right, now what? What can we learn from this? So here are some attempts to structure these data and see what these different types of structures might tell us. And mom and dad are clear winners here. <laughs> this is also from the first grade. And this is the famous chicken noodle soup. Now, children surveyed people in their class and then eventually other students in the school about what was their favorite soup. And we can see at the top left corner, hope it's all obvious to you, tomato soup, then chicken soup, some kind of vegetable soup. <laughs> this is a facsimile, but they decided they needed to convince the cook to stop serving tomato soup all the time and that the cook needed data. So this is a wall graph. And with it, they were able to persuade the cook that at least there was clear preference for chicken noodle. Now, that doesn't mean that the cook ever did anything else, but this was an effort to persuade them to change. I think the squid is a ringer. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a, um, another effort after uh, modeling data, except a little bit more complicated problem. So more for upper grades, fourth and fifth graders. The question here is, uh, we took this from uh, kids who were draw doing self-portraits, and um, <clears throat> we asked, uh, what was the question? It turned out there wasn't any question. It was supposed to be about me, a social studies thing. So we converted the question, since we had all these portraits, of could you predict the grade and age of the artist just see in the portrait without knowing. Okay, so it becomes a problem and how would you discriminate among these? Well, to solve that problem, you have to think about data structure again. And this is one of the first attempts. 
and you'll see that it's going to be a little bit difficult to use. And what makes it difficult? Okay, a lot of features. But it's hard to compare across. So this makes evident the need for a different kind of data structure, one that has dimension. And of course, we also have issues here of what's diagnostic. They all have heads, so maybe that's not a feature that's going to do much for our model. So students developed descriptions of eyes, of hair. The first descriptions of eyes had 27 categories. So this was an opportunity to think about data abstraction. And then they looked at the portraits and recorded whether or not they could find these features and thought about the relative frequencies of these things and started to weight the features according to the relative frequencies. It turned out that this was a pretty good model, except it didn't discriminate first graders from, say, second graders. It could discriminate first from third, third from fifth. So we learned that we needed to revise the model if we wanted to do a better job, and we looked for other features. It turns out that the way you draw a nose is pretty diagnostic, and the way you draw ears is pretty diagnostic. And so you can get a finer discrimination. So this is what we mean by modeling in this instance. Yes? Chris, um, just getting handled, when they came up with this criteria, they had a subset of pictures where they knew the grade. I'm just trying to get it. Yes, they have, they have a subset of pictures where they know the grade. And, then and the challenge is... To get a bunch of other ones. Yes. Okay, and actually, thank you for raising that. That's another issue, and the issue there is one of um, modeling. They got to, to the point where they could predict the, set, the sample they had, yeah. and then they were surprised when they went to new samples that sometimes things didn't work too well, that including some features really tuned it, but then made it less general. So it was a nice situation to do that. We also um, tried to track um, students and how they're thinking about the mathematics. And this is one of the items from some measures that we developed. The purpose of the measures was to try to triangulate what we thought we saw happening in classrooms. But also it's a vehicle because, as I'll get to shortly, we're working with teachers and we want to give feedback to the system about how well we're doing. So this one says, well, if you had an octahedron, which of those things would fold up to make it? There are uh, three more after this on the, on the same, uh, same item. Here's another item nearer and dearer to people's hearts about you know, conventional kind of graphing and uh, rate questions. So we gave these tests, um, developed these tests, and try to track yearly progress with them. We put them on a common scale and then try to look at change. We also then looked at the number, the proportion of the students who were showing change. So it wasn't just mean change. In the first year of the project, year, the first change, we had about 94% of individuals benefiting. That went down to 80% in year two to three in, in terms of the gain. But generally, this wasn't what we were doing wasn't just benefiting one slice of uh, the student population. What is it compared to? It's only compared to itself because the thing is that if you're doing these forms of, of mathematics, they're not part of uh, curriculum. And so we could get a control group. Um, actually, uh, one of the controls for one of our studies were undergraduates at Wisconsin. Um, because it, 
it's like asking someone a question about uh, symmetries and they haven't really thought about symmetries or they haven't had these kinds of experiences. So you can get differences, but we're not sure what you're controlling for. What those do show, though, is that they show that the first grade teachers were doing better the second year than the first year. Mm -hmm. And similarly with the second and the third and the fourth. So what we're able to track is progress on the part of the teachers looking at their students' performance across the And then if you look at individual items, you can say, you know, the usual. All right, so if we're going to have these forms of practice, we have to reconsider teaching. So we worked with teachers, and still do here, to try to build a community. And the center of the community was around student thinking. And these forms of mathematics and the sciences that we'll be talking about shortly. So every month, we would meet for at least a day, but usually two, and bring samples of student work, and talk, or teachers would bring in ideas of something they tried, and we'd look at how students might think about these things and why they might be doing that. We would have summer institutes where teachers would engage in some of the same things that we hoped that they would engage their children. So it wasn't that we were giving them things that children would do, but rather we were giving them forms of activity that we thought would push their knowledge of the mathematics and science. And they also formed study groups, and actually this, is, this came from them, in which they would read books like um, the uh, Beak of the Finch, and think about ideas like evolution and what it might imply for what went on inside the classroom. Leona and I worked with subsets of teachers to conduct design studies in classrooms. An idea from a summer institute. We wanted to map the diversity in the wood, in the wood lot of the school. This was led by Jim Stewart, a science educator at Madison. But we had to come, away, come up with a way of describing that piece of land, and you couldn't see to the other side of it. So this presented a problem in mapping. And we engaged teachers in this. At first, they thought it was a really ridiculous thing to do, so they refused to do it, because they said, if you want to know about diversity, you just walk in and you look around. But that quickly uh, became evident that that wasn't such a great plan. So we tried to um, develop a map and the mathematics that went into the map and also uh, look at relative diversity in different parts of that woodlot and then try to come back and think, well, um, th those are representing uh, different numbers of species. Why would those be different? Well, how could we account for that? And during our little chats around student work, we often explored things ourselves, like what happens with this kind of system. We have these tobacco hornworms that we were growing in classrooms. We know that they're prolific. Um, could we model their potential growth? And could we think about things like, why aren't we swimming in a sea of tobacco hornworms? Teachers also wrote about their experiences, and we collected things in two forms. There's a in-print book by Teachers College Press on the teacher's work with data, and we also developed web resources so that teacher's work could be represented and shared in the teaching community. So we'd like to turn now to putting some of this work to use in modeling nature. It always seems to clip one way for boys and another way for girls, right? I'm going to rapidly give you a little picture of what this looks like as you think about development across grades. And in this case, we're going to look at children learning about ideas of uh, change, in this case, life sciences. So we're talking about growth and development. And um, 
Uh, in our case, we were looking at children from the very early elementary years all on up until late elementary. And we first needed to consider what kinds of mathematical resources they would have at hand to do this sort of work. Well, the young children had the mathematics of difference. And by that, I mean they could literally subtract two, value, two values to tell how much something had grown. Older children, second and third graders in this case, were beginning to develop mathematics of ratio. And by the time our children were in late elementary school, they were able to think about ideas of distribution. I'll say a little bit more about this as I go on. So young children, growing flowering bulbs under different conditions, amaryllis, narcissus, little irises. And they were tracking changes in the growth of the bulbs over time. Uh, remember Rich's discussion about similarity being a very important thing as young children come to agree that you can represent something in the world by a symbol. Uh, we noticed right off the bat that our very young kids, the kindergartners and first graders, were willing to cut out strips that represented changes in the heights of the bulbs over time. But initially, they were adamant that every single strip had to be green. And it had to be adorned by a great big flat, a fat flower or possibly a bulb, if that was the stage of the, uh, of the plant's development. Well, this was fine until we got to actually thinking about comparing the plants. Once we started comparing the plants, all those green strips got really confusing. And finally, as children began to agree that what was important here was changes in height and not the appearance of the flower and not the stage of the bulb, those things began to drop away from the representations. And it even became possible that you could compare two different bulbs by using colors that didn't represent the stems at all. Right? So what children were able to do was to look at times when the plants were growing fastest and times when they were growing slower and to think about why that might be. Initially, as you might expect, children were very um, influenced by the way the plants look now, which one is tallest. When I talked about the mathematics of difference, I mean going back to look not just at the present stage, but how we can look at those graphs and think about change. Where are the greatest periods of change and why might those be happening at that point? Kids uh, talked about um, the fact that the, um, the uh, amaryllis that was growing in soil grew fastest at first, but then as one little kid said, um, the one that grew in, wa in water catched up. So they're using um, their ability to measure and to, um, and to compute difference to talk about periods of fast growth. Well, by the time children are in the third grade, uh, each of them are growing their own plants, in this case, the, the little Wisconsin fast plants, the ones that grow very quickly within 40 days. And what they're doing is they're tracking the amount of growth in millimeters between successive days of measure. And they're now able to compute rates of growth and again, to be able to think more precisely about what we mean by when the plant is growing faster and when it's growing slower. More sophisticated mathematics, more sophisticated forms of modeling. When, for example, does a typical plant begin to take off on its growth spurt? How typical is that? And here you see kids beginning to uh, think about generalization. This is an attempt to draw a line that represents, as the teacher said, not just one of our plants, but all of our plants together. How could we do that? And what they did was they represented each of these plants' heights on a day of growth by one of these dots. And then the question became, well, where do we draw the line? Where do we draw that line? Big argument about that because the children wanted to draw the line in the middle of the range. But what that meant was that the line went, in some cases, through a value where there was no dot. Whoa, what does it mean that you have a typical height on a day that no particular plant actually matches? So really interesting questions about what that might mean. This allows children to uh, ask many more questions that they would not be likely to ask if they simply looked at the plants. In this case, a third grader asking, do the roots of the plants grow like the shoots, or do they grow differently? So here we have a graph that represents changes in the length of the root, changes in the height of the shoot, and an initial inspection convinced the kids, no, no, they don't grow similarly at all. Because if you look at the rates of growth between similar periods, they're not the same. 
However, one little girl rushed up to the board and said, but wait a minute, wait a minute, she said. If you flip the curve on the bottom, what you see is that same S shape. And the, the notion of the S shape as a general function that denotes growth is something that the kids became very familiar with when they saw it in, in these different circumstances. In the fifth grade, we begin to look at collections of plants and how we can make conclusions about collections. So here we have uh, children um, who have each grown a large number of these fast plants. I think there are 63 of them. And uh, each of the plant heights is recorded on the 23rd day of growth. And the teacher has asked children to find a way of representing the data that would show somebody both what a typical height is and how spread out the heights are. Okay? Um, we tend to spend a lot of time with teachers and their children inventing and critiquing different ways of displaying data rather than giving children recipes for how to fill out data tables and how to construct data displays. And what we find is if we start with those very young children on the how you wake up kinds of things that Rich talked about, by the time they're in fifth grade, they're pretty um, savvy critiquers of each other's displays. The one on the left simply has a line scaled to represent the height of each of the plants, and then they're placed in ascending order. And this little boy said that you could see what was, what was typical by looking at plateaus on the graph. He wasn't very happy, though, with his answer of how you'd know how spread out they are. All he could come up with was, well, look at the smallest and the tallest. And somebody pointed out that you could have even a taller one all the way over here. Would we be happy that, with that as a measure of spread out? This is a display that another group of children made. They tended to like this one better because they said it, you could see where the data were clumping. And you could also see where the holes were. Eventually, the kids in this group went on to invent a kind of an informal standard deviation. They began to look at the average distance of each of the measures from the median and to begin to think about that as a measure of precision when they were measuring their plants and a measure of change in the plants as the plants grew. Our objective here was to get kids to begin to look at these distributions and make conclusions about the growth of the plants. Why, for example, when the plants first began growing, did we see all the plants piled up on the left-hand side of the curve? Why, as they grew, did we see something that looked like a kind of a normal curve that began to spread across the graph? And the kids got very savvy in interpreting those kinds of curves. Um, we're going to close by telling you a little bit more about one of these investigations of children in the sixth grade now. Um, and this is sort of a cap on the... Um, life sciences work that we were doing. Children became interested in uh, studies of ecology, and they were very interested in studying two local ponds, one large retention pond and one smaller pond near the school. And they started off by visiting the pond and making, um, uh, taking samples and try to get, trying to get a sense of, as the teacher said, who lives here, looking at both plants and animals of different kinds in the ponds. Um, as time went on, they began to come back to the classroom, and they built two different kinds of models, each of which told them something different about the original ponds that they visited. One was a large tub. I think it was originally one of those kinds of tubs that you're supposed to bury in your garden to make an outdoor pond. And it had um, uh, aquatic plants and uh, animals living in it. As I recall, it used to spend the summers out on uh, Rich's patio. And his cat and every other cat in the neighborhood would cruise the pond and <laughs> occasionally go fishing. Um, the, the, the job that the children tried to accomplish with that pond was to try to see if they could get it to become a self-sustaining system. And over time, they realized with some disastrous consequences that this was a lot harder in a small tub than it was in a large pond. But things got really dicey when the teacher brought each of them a, a one-liter pickle jar, sold a lot of pickles in the school that year, and told them that each of them would now have the challenge of trying to create a sustainable system in the one-liter pickle jar. That was a very, very interesting investigation. Here's one that... Um, is actually looking quite good. Uh, they didn't all look this good. <laughs> the children had choices of several substrates that they might use, kinds of soil, gravel, 
clay and the like. They had choice of several different kinds of aquatic plants and eventually um, little animals that could be introduced into their jar. And um, they uh, struggled a lot with this idea of what do we mean by sustainable and how would we know if we had a, a jar that was sustainable. And they began to spend a lot of time in thinking about how you would measure the health of a system. This was brought right to their attention when several of the jars early on um, crashed in an incredible stinky mess. And they began to realize that their initial ideas about growth maybe weren't exactly right because their initial ideas were, oh, your jar is health healthy if nothing, nothing dies. And over time, that began to transform to your jar is healthy if it actually begins to reproduce, if you get more plants and more animals. So more reproduction must be better, right? And that had the obvious consequence of the crashing jars that couldn't sustain themselves and the, um, and the stinky consequences, which, by the way, often led to other investigations of things like algae. The children invented a number of measures with these jars. Uh, I remember that one of them had... Um, a series of paint chips of different color that they used to look at the health of the plants. Uh, one little boy was interested in how you could find the number of Daphnia, small water crustaceans, swimming in the jars. He uh, cut out a small cardboard window that he could lay over a jar, count the number of, of little tiny creatures within the window, and based on that, make an extrapolation about the number of, of creatures in the jar. So they invented and swapped a lot of these measures. Whoops. I'm going backward. Along the way, in addition to thinking about modeling, teachers needed to think about a number of other things. How, for example, do you get children thinking about what is a question worth asking in science? And it was helpful for us to track the children, changes in the children's criteria across the year. Um, the teacher sat down with them and said, you tell me what you think makes a good question. And they would periodically come back to that and post their criteria and call each other to account by these criteria. At the beginning of the year, they agreed that a good question is one that's genuine. We don't already know the answer and can't look it up easily in the encyclopedia. They also agreed that it's doable, that it's something you actually could investigate with the tools at hand or tools you could get. By the end of the year, they were adding other criteria, such as people can piggyback on the question. In other words, we learn more from this question by combining it with questions that other people have asked or it inspires other people to ask additional questions. The question is sensible. It actually means something to us. It contributes to our present state of understanding. In addition, there were changes in students' criteria about what counted as evidence. Um, everything from because my teacher said so, or, or I read it in a book, I heard it from my grandma, to this is something I actually have experienced myself. Eventually, too, I collected data and organized it and represented it in ways that actually were able to convince other people to finally, because I only included evidence that directly related to my question and answer. Children are usually very impelled by the idea of including every possible piece of data that relates even peripherally to the question at hand. If you remember the, the, the portraits, only over time do children realize that what you eliminate from your explanation can make your explanation stronger, almost as much sometimes as what you include. Um, the children uh, began to take on um, some of the formats for discussion that were suggested by uh, one of the graduate students in entomology who was working with us. She told them that their group met together in research meetings and discussed the questions they were investigated and what they were learning. So the children began to take on this format as well. Um, every week, um, the teacher would choose a group by lottery, picking out one of the popsicle sticks. That group would stand up and explain where they were in their best investigations. And they would get feedback and critique from other students in the group. So here, for example, is one of the discussions. Um, th there's a little boy named Denzel who was concerned that um, uh, the animals in his jar weren't looking too well. Um, he was investigating the question about how fish and frogs in the jar would affect the dissolved oxygen in the, in the jar. Uh, but as time went on, his fish and frogs weren't looking happy, so he suggested the possibility of taking them out and putting them in a kind of a hospital jar that had a bubbler to revive them back to life. 
And what you see here is this other little boy, Ivar, saying, you know, you can do that. You can revise your fish and frogs, but is that really going to help you answer your question about dissolved oxygen? So this is kind of interesting in the sense that you see children doing what children do, that is sort of losing sight of their original question and getting concerned about, wait a minute, I've got to save these fish and frogs. But in the context of the research meeting, another child calls him to account for the question that he says he's trying to investigate. Um, when we do these studies in classrooms, um, we uh, spend some time with teachers investigating the learning that students are actually accomplishing. In the case of this one, we designed um, a study at the end to look at changes in children's understanding of what it means to design an inquiry. We looked at their understanding of the kinds of uh, measurements that were being used in the classroom. Uh, how they began to think about the functioning of this jar as an ecological system. And then here was a big one. Did they consider these jars to have anything to do with the pond that they were originally studying? Or were they just jars? And finally, did they learn anything about the nature of science? What we found is that 81% of the children actually conducted experiments, such as the effects of pH on dissolved oxygen. Um, the rest of the children um, engaged in something more like observational comparative study. And by that I mean they did not necessarily design and set up a controlled study, but they were able to compare their jars to other jars in the classroom in ways that would allow them to come to a definitive conclusion about something that they were interested in, perhaps algae growth or the kind of substrate. Uh, the students had no trouble understanding the logic of control of variables. And this is interesting because the literature suggests that sixth graders should have quite a, deal, uh, quite a good deal of difficulty with this. Um, we now believe that um, much of the developmental literature continues to get that result about children because they put children in unfamiliar situations where there's nothing much at stake and where children don't understand either the system or what the purpose of that design might be. When you put children in situations where they have opportunities to learn and where there are stakes to the consequences, we don't find them having problems uh, with things like the control of variables. Children had a great deal of difficulty actually making a jar that would sustain itself long enough so that they could learn something. And in fact, if you think about it, that's a very important practice in science. Scientists don't run into the lab and make a discovery every day. They spend a lot of their time trying to think about how to set up the world so that it will tell them something. And we think that that's an important part of a process for children to engage in as well. It's also a part, by the way, that many science curricula make invisible to children by either giving the recipes that they simply carry out or by making sure that children don't struggle with that part. Um, almost all of the children were able to come up with a measure that actually addressed their question. And um, many of them understood that finding a measure that they could actually quantify would send them back to ask a different form of the question. For example, a child who first asked, what is the effect of the fish, eventually revised his question to, what is the effect of the fish on levels of dissolved oxygen? Um, most of the children invented new measures to pursue their question, and those new measures were combined by the children around the classroom in composite measures of health. So they made a bushiness index for plant growth. Uh, one little child invented what he called a toothpick test to uh, measure the density of algae growth. He would prick the, the algae growth and put it on a plate and see how quickly it grew. In terms of what they learned about ecology, they certainly learned about the functional roles of the part of this system. Um, and many of their explanations of the system were quite complex and included many players. 64% um, of their explanations took the forms of webs or cycles so that they were sort of a complete cycle. This is a little more uh, complex and um, maybe problematic, we're not sure. 50% um, of the children agreed that the jar could serve as a model of the aquatic environment. But some of the children were disturbed by this. We didn't get the kind of reasoning that you sometimes see. Oh, that's not a pond, it's a jar. 
can't you see it's got glass in it, it's got a metal rim but we did get kids worrying about the fact that in many ways the jar doesn't really behave like a pond and some of those ways are very important and in fact they're right the jar crashes very very easily you make a mistake in your guesses about what to put into it and your jar is not going to be a sustainable a sustainable system in contrast the pond is much more resistant to that kind of um, to that kind of change so the question about the extent to which this serves as a model and the extent to which it doesn't is actually a rather sophisticated discussion the children were very concerned um, uh, when we asked them about this way of doing science as opposed to how they'd done it in the past with the fact that they were the ones who made the decisions they were the ones who asked the questions they were the ones who lived with the consequences and they, they actually saw that as a good thing a desirable thing they also liked the fact that they sometimes were the experts who knew about things in these jars that quite exceeded the teachers knowledge I remember one little boy for example who became the all-time algae expert uh, studied algae on the web had every book you've ever seen about algae he absolutely knew more about algae than the teacher did and there were other specialists in the classroom too they felt the research meetings were important they pointed out that um, these were um, formats that required required them to be accountable to the other children in the class and not just to the teacher and um, we would like to point out that we're involved now in similar studies here in Nashville uh, Kevin Catley and Jerry Hinn have been helping us with a group of children here in Nashville who are studying the diversity of organisms in Warner Park here you see some kids out there measuring the circumference of trees of various kinds so to close, um, what do we think that modeling contributes to inquiry? Uh, first of all, this idea about the fact that modeling doesn't come for free, that you have to work at it, that setting up uh, a facsimile of the world so that you can learn something about the world, instrumentation, scientists call it, is a, a very important thing and very important for students to understand. Um, of course we're interested in children understanding the content developing these ideas about ecology about measures about interactions we're also um, pretty convinced that it's important for children to study something over an extended period of time and not to spend time on the typical two weeks in rocks and minerals two weeks in electricity and magnetism two weeks in the rainforest because it is as their knowledge deepens that they begin to ask more interesting questions it's that as they ask more interesting questions that the form of data that they collect gets more sophisticated and their arguments develop if you don't let that process develop you get a continual reinvention of shallow forms of thinking and shallow forms of knowledge we also think it's very important to encourage children in activities that allow them to become experts in something so that individual children can explore their personal interests and bring them back to the development of the group I think Ann Brown used to refer to that as the idea of majoring you know we teach our PhD students all of them they become the expert in that thing and we think that that's the right way for people to learn how to learn it works very well with young children as well and finally this format of the research meetings has been very important for something that is often missing from the kinds of scientific investigations that children do uh, children make things happen and they propose explanations for those things but how are their explanations called to account that's difficult if children don't have any facility with thinking about forms of data and mathematics and if they don't reside in a community where you're called to be accountable then children don't develop those forms of reasoning finally um, we're interested in the idea that children's conceptual knowledge as well as their forms of reasoning best emerge as children go back and forth between an interesting phenomenon in the world an attempt to represent it in a drawing or a map or a mathematical expression or a model they look at their model they look at the world they say this doesn't account for the phenomenon I want let me go back let me revise it this will often change the questions that they ask about the world
like the fruit flies, the questions about where the fruit flies were wouldn't have come up if the fruit flies didn't come up. So we like to think of science education as a kind of a developmental stretching from very early drawings and diagrams and recordings of things on up to increasingly more mathematical descriptions. And one way you might think of science education, instead of thinking of it as a collection of factoids or pieces of ideas about things that everybody thinks are science, as you might think instead about the kinds of models that are going to give you the most bang for the buck over the long run. And whether you can hook those into important forms of science so that children can grow those ideas over time and actually have them available when they, uh, when they enter new forms of, uh, of science or any other kind of, uh, kind of investigation. And I think that's it for us. Do any of you have any brief questions for us? I guess we have a moment or two. Is there a mechanism to get your research into the schools on more of a, a larger scale? There's a short answer to that and a long answer to that. Rich, do you want to take this on? Because we can probably do the most of this. Um, I'll give you the short answer. No. <laughs> um, what we're, the reason we're doing this kind of work is um, we're trying to understand whether or not it's feasible and under what kinds of conditions. And working here is very different than working in Wisconsin, and we're learning about that. Um, we don't think that it's impossible, but it's different. And so we need to understand that. So our emphasis first is trying to understand something. And um, we're not yet at a point where it would be uh, feasible or even all that interesting to talk about scale. We would be like the kids in with the compost columns. What about we're doing? Would we want to travel? We do a lot of replication in different places and under different conditions. So Rich has spent a lot of time working in the inner city of Phoenix. Um, we spent time working in Madison. We're very interested in what we're learning here. Uh, we have uh, partners now in uh, Washington State. Um, it's important to sort of understand what is stable and what changes when you go from place to place. And we think that's a critical part of scale that people often don't think explicitly about. We are working very closely with teachers and students here, though. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Is there one more question that people may have? Towards the end, you mentioned sort of a, conti a continual reinvention of sort of the shallow forms of knowledge. If students at a young age aren't allowed to ask questions or think critically and then form arguments or you know, their own um, sort of specialized. Uh, and I was just wondering how you feel, or, you know, to what extent you know about the core curriculum at sc in schools and how that may relate to critical thinking versus sort of more shallow forms of knowledge. Does that make sense? There, there has been a lot of talk in meetings of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Research Council, about the fact that the current science standards, the national science standards, that many of the local standards are based upon, were a very important step. But now people are saying that um, they still have the problem of being both too wide and too um, unguided, so that teachers can enter almost anywhere. And the uh, result is, this school system does one set of things, that school system does another set of things. It becomes impossible for children's knowledge to build over time. And even if you look at the tests of children's science knowledge, they tend to have two kinds of information in them. Very shallow factoids, and only a few about any topic, because the test takers can't be sure that children will have studied any particular topic. Or things that look like intelligence tests you know, graph reading. And I suspect that they're measures of general intelligence and not of science at all. I think people need agreement on a smaller set of very, very powerful ideas and knowledge about how those actually could develop over time. It's like math. Rich said this. What if you did long division one day and fractions the next day and the day after that geometry and none of it ever built? 
we, we would laugh at that. And somehow we take for granted that that's what science is supposed to be. It solves a lot of problems for us because teachers can teach the thing they feel most comfortable with or the one piece of science that they build some knowledge about. But it causes a lot of other difficulties. And if we did that narrowing, teachers could build the expertise they need. Great answer. Thank you for coming. Yes, thank you, Rich and Leona, for being here.